no sharks. Are you recording this for pure just interest in the sharks or? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to see how many we see and if, you know, after the fact, I want to send some of the screen captures to uh, an expert who Daniel uh, knows, uh, who wrote some papers on them and see if if he thinks they're one or multiple species and then we can maybe see if there's anything that we have based on our depth and which seamounts we're on, if it would be Fish. useful to you know, expand the known range of them, but it, it depends on what the IDs can be. It's really tough with ROV only observations um, to identify some species because you can't take specific measurements. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it's kind of, I'm just writing down, and I might go through the NA138 when I, like on the transit back, just to see if there's, you know, other inf information on the sharks is in this area. But fish inverted? We'll see. It is. I'm not sure that's normal. <laughs> Looks like he, they know that they're fine. Maybe they're just put on a show. It's a, it's a good zoom, though. It is. Yeah, I need to take a highlight of that. Watch out for that urchin. Yeah, spiky. So there are actually um, some fish that are inverted in Papahanaumokuakeo on the prognathodes. They actually go under overhangs and they hang upside down. And that's how they kind of spend their life. They're pretty cool. Um, can we get a zoom in on that white thing and then the white corals on the right? Okay. This, this thing first? Yes, please. Real up close. Personal. All right, go for zoom. Well, it's a type of white um, glass sponge. And we also have some brachiopods. Okay. You said you wanted the other two corals as well? Yes, please. Sebastian, we're at a meter altitude here, and there's organisms that we're zooming on. Would it be a good time for our final Niskin? Um, or do you want to wait till we're, I mean, we're on the highest isobath? We okay. are on the highest isobath. I'm not seeing too many corals. It may be worth okay. a Niskin. We, but could, we could wait. All right. We can wait. It's pretty fast. Yeah, no, you're too. right. They're, they're, we'll those aren't corals. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Small white coral. Don't think we've seen this guy either. It's just now in the highest isobath. We're good, thank you. All right. Oh, one got crashed, it looks like. Hawaii. Oh, push. Wait, you say these are broken sheet flows? Mm -hmm. Especially now that I'm looking at them, they're super flat. Next time we see a low bait flow, can you point it out to me? Absolutely. I see a little bit of yellow on that rock too. <laughs>
You remember I asked um, Virginia during her uh, talk in the in the in the mess about if um, you know why corals are different colors if there's there's no light down here. Um, I it hadn't. I, I've been on a lot of expeditions where we've looked at different corals and that hadn't occurred to me until she was talking. I was like, why are they different colors? <laughs> And it's it's really fascinating that they they you know they have some theories, but they don't really know for sure. Um, it's it's kind of cool. It's interesting that we're still seeing some of those dead sponges all the way near yeah. up here as well. Maybe the e uh, the e DNA could. Maybe explain it? I don't know. Maybe, but I believe most of these EDNAs are going to be focused on coral studies. Massive lava flow. Massive sheet flow. This is a cool area up here. Oh, I agree. What would cause those holes right there in mm, I was rock. thinking, so I know normal, if it wasn't, if it was a terrestrial environment, you saw those holes, that'd be from one of the sediment, like one of those rocks that make it up falling out. And then because of erosion and weathering, that hole gets Where's bigger over time. And so sometimes that makes me wonder if like the current weathers some of these things Cause yeah i think it can because we've seen evidence so far of like the current smoothing out these mm -hmm. manganese coat like cup coatings so we know current is that strong to smooth these rocks so maybe they're strong enough to like take out some of the loose rocks there and just leave these patches not patches but like those mm -hmm. holes especially since some of them are the size of like you know these little grains. Yeah. That makes sense. And also, again, I think towards the top, we're gonna have more like breakage because everything's like going down. Mm -hmm. So, sloping down. So I feel like there's gonna be a lot more fragments and stuff. And the color that we're seeing on the rocks, like just this like dark color, mm -hmm. is that the color of the manganese crust? Mm -hmm. And so like, I'm just excited to see when we like cut the rocks open, like what the insides look like. Yeah. Or just like what yeah. color the actual rock is. Yeah. It seems a lot of them have been like a dark brown. Uh, Some of them at least, the ones that I saw you guys cut open. We, yeah, so from the first seamount, we had two different types of basalts. We had a vesicular, olivine basalt and then we just had uh, an altered uh, reddish color yeah that must basalt. be the one I saw and that one was really altered that you could see the different times that it was altered and also you can see that it was it's an old rock so that's what we were looking at from that sample and then the next seamount, which was the Loudon, that one was full of, I don't want to say like fine green, cause, but it was a very like cement matrix. It, it, it wasn't vesicular, but it was like grayish to brown. And there were some, uh, there was a really nice vesicular basalt from there that we were really excited to show everybody. Mm. So then this one that, we did yesterday. We have not c cut them open yet. We saw them open yet. We're sawing them tomorrow. So if we see anything exciting, bet that I'll. W Can we get a zoom we get on that so one, Paul? We get so excited call? and we like run up the stairs. Me and Dr. Val and we're like, oh, we're like showing everybody who's in the galley, and it's just super fun. I love that. But yeah, we saw really nice. Uh, clinopyroxene crystals. And That's cool. They were pretty. They they were in a pretty good. Um, Go for zoom. Uh, state. Mm -hmm. However, olivine, which is known as like 
the green crystal. I like olivine. Yeah, I love it too. <laughs> um, it I haven't seen this coral so far. Really? Oh, that's cool. Has a white base with the yellow. Yellow coral. Top isobath. Uh, All right, thank you. What was that? Sample eDNA. Um, should we take an email DNA now? We're basically at Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're basically here. here. So, yeah, let's, yeah, let's go ahead and grab one. If we could be at, uh, like, one meter altitude. Sure. So, the ship is stopped, just FYI. If you had, uh, like, weathered clinoperoxenes, would they de would they be declinoperoxenes? No. No? no. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, so the olivine was altered to Eddingstonite. So it went from green to this like bright orange, bright orange, and you can see it in the in the sample. I want to come down there and look at that. That's cool. Yeah, I have thin sections too of my samples that I actually showed Miss Malio, and um, it had some examples of Eddingstonite, which is an alteration of olivine. So. Yeah. What causes that alteration? Heat and pressure? Water. Water? Oh. Yeah. Water can do some damage to, to these rocks. Or basalts. But that's okay. I love them anyway. Even if they're not perfect, I love them. Uh, we need uh, file off port on. Yep. The camera's page. Down my arm. Correcting me back. Thank you. We're going for. We are going for the skin two. Two. Looking at the sun setting, and I don't know if it is setting, but it, yeah. it's blinding. <laughs> Blink. Miskin triggered. Nice. Nice. Uh, awesome. that's sample zero six eight. Where are we six meters up? No, we're on top of like a like a rock here, so the back of the vehicle is uh, okay. off of the rock. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's it's like jump between gotcha. Six and Okay. Oh no now we're at nine. <laughs> okay. Thanks. When we used to live up in Alaska this time of year. Uh, you're losing daylight so fast that each day has six minutes less daylight than the day before. So every 10 days you lose an hour of daylight. So I think we can just kind of like slowly work north just along this little um, summit. Okay. And just see what we see. Good. I yep. can't imagine. I feel like living in Alaska, you would definitely need blackout curtains. Uh, you know what most people use, is, if you have kids, aluminum foil. What? Yeah, you just put aluminum foil on your kid's bedroom. Much cheaper.
So you said the holes in these, oh, holes and flows. Um, holes in the flows are from uh, gas release, correct? It could, that could also be a good, a good explanation for it too. But I was, I was thinking it could be from That's a rock it. leaving it maybe, and then the current causing more erosion. But I don't know, it would have to depend on maybe it's, maybe that's possible if it's a vesicular flow. I can totally see that. But I think the only way I would be able to know is if like we zoomed in really close on, on the rock. Ah. Uh, because- You're gonna wrap out? I mean, you don't want to do it? I I'm sure coming back towards the- What do we want to do? Towards Zoom in on the holes in the rock? Sure. Yeah. What is that? A jelly? <laughs> Uh, fish? Oh, well, that looks like some it. kind of fish. Egg case? No. No, it's a it? fish. I did notice that um, when we sawed open some of the rocks from the last place, last seamount, it, it, the manganese crust did not look like it was vesicular. So, but when we cut it open, it still had vesicular bubbles. Mm -hmm. And um, so now I'm worried that if it is a vesicular flow, maybe, um, maybe we won't be able to tell. If it's manganese or not. Uh, by it's manganese or not. Mm. But I mean, it's still fun to look. I'm, I'm still down to look at it. I'm curious how lava flows interact when they go over manganese. Do they layer at all? Do you think they adjust the actual composition in the rock? When manganese is covers, exposed to, is, is covered exposed. by a lava flow. Okay. Well, the thing is, how would, how would we know? Like. Yeah, like how would we know? We would only have, to, we would only be able to know if it was like uplifted, uplifted like to a terrestrial thing. Can you come down from the wind too, but. Are these some of those holes, Hannah? Yeah. So like any one of these, literally they're they're everywhere. Wherever is easiest for the front row. So I know on terrestrial kind of volcanoes, those are could be also air pockets. Because mm -hmm. we have a lot of like lava tubes and mm -hmm. those vesicles are real common too. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if there would ever be like areas within the seamount that may be hollow. Yeah, we have seen it. We saw it yesterday. Well, not yesterday, but on the last unnamed scene mount because I remember when we saw it, it was hollow and we were joking about wanting to go inside of it and like oh. seeing what it looked like. And then I was like, oh my gosh, it's like, it's like in, um, when we went to when I went to Hilo mm -hmm. and there were those lava tubes and also what Sebastian was saying about one of his stories about walking over this lava field right. and being worried about falling through. <laughs> and then I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, what if it is hollow? Mm -hmm. But it's also hard to tell because there is sediment covering it. And if there wasn't, maybe we would be able to tell how like deep it goes mm -hmm. and like how thin it is. And maybe that's also a really good Good idea. That's, and where does I like lead? adding all these like different possibilities together. Two eels. Rat tail. Or Rat eel. Puhi? That's a eel. A puhi. Puhi. Oh, two of them. Yeah, there's another one. I'm blind. Where's the second one? It's up. Oh, yeah, that one went out. That oh one? the other one was up here somewhere. Oh, okay. Yeah. I feel better now because I was like, <laughs> I don't see it. Oh, it is a rat tail, I think. Mm. Yeah. I think so. 
so not a poohy. Well, okay, what kind of rocks are these now? Or what kind of flow? Hmm. These could be pillow. Or yeah. could be low bait. I need, I need to s more time to think. <laughs> I definitely think I think it's more low bait because I'm seeing like this, yeah, and then that, and then there's low bait's kind of like pillow lava, but it's moving too slow for it to be pillowing out, right? Well, moving too fast. Oh, low bait moves fast. Faster, faster than pillow lava. Oh, okay. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I was thinking about it the wrong backwards. Yeah, that makes sense. You were there. Got you were it. There. I'm there. But yeah, I would think this is low bait. Nice. Good job. Yeah, I noticed it was different. Yeah. It didn't look as flat. I did see when I went on the monkey deck earlier today, I saw one of the albatross birds with the turquoise blue beak and red feet. Really? Oh, wow. Uh -huh. a booby? Well, yeah, a booby. it's a booby, right? Yeah. But it's not the blue-footed booby. We saw those at the, in the Marshall Islands. That's like my favorite. <laughs> my favorite bird. I see him all the time. I love him or her. <laughs> it would be cool to see an albatross. Like, they're huge. Their yeah. wingspans can be like seven feet. They're just spectacular birds. Hans was telling us how they're all over the midway uh, runways. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's like over a million seabirds that make their home on Midway. That's crazy. Helani. Wow. Yeah. Can we get a zoom in on that red spot on the sponge? Of course. Thank you. Is it uh It looks like a big octacorn? Oh, it's crab. a crab. Yeah, there's oh, a crab on it. Oh, it's a crab? I thought it was a heck uh, one of those octo. <laughs> Wait, no, or oh no, it's a mushroom coral. It's a mushroom coral, yeah. Oh my god. I was like, there's too the many the spikes for it to be a crab. Wait, go for zoom. That's cool. Whoa. Does it look like that's the um, mushroom coral is doing better than the sponge? I think so. Um, it looks like they're both alive. Fully alive to yeah, me. I think that's sediment on the sponge. Yeah, that's just sediment. Uh, that's not dying sponge. Okay. That is I was beautiful. just looking at this. Yeah, I thought that's, this was. That's sediment on it. That's wow. a crab, though. Oh, there is a crab. I was right to an extent. Oh, no, I thought this is starfish. <laughs> sea star. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a brittle star. Brittle stars, yeah. But right here, I uh, can't tell. I think that's a. Brittle star? Yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. The, the crinoid. Yeah, you can see the curls behind the crinoid. That's definitely real stars. It's like a beautiful arrangement. You know, yeah. like Ikebana? It's Whoa, very what elegant. Is, yeah. Oh, and then there's, yeah. Uh, is that a new coral? I have not seen that. What's that? Um, can we get a quick zoom in on that? Yeah, I, think coral. I think they're a type of zoanthid, if I'm going to guess. Zoanthid. There's a cup coral behind the last bunch, too. We're going in four seconds. Oh, there's cup coral here? Mm-hmm. There's a cup coral? Oh. That one's really cool. Oh, is this still... You think those are, like, all part of it? I think it's closed polyps up there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these, I think this might be that lined coral we all mentioned earlier. Lined? Yeah, you can see how it's all connected in a line. On yeah, the lined. I don't think that's the official name, um, but that's what I've been calling it. Is this still an Ephyrus coral? That's what I think. Is that Rennie? Yeah, we're good. I guess it's me. Hi, that Rennie. Was <coughs> that was a spiritual guy talking from the <laughs> other realm. Rennie just haunts the ship <laughs> at all times. I live in, in the SPL. <laughs> <laughs> A ghost in the show. Yeah, that's probably Argus. I 
has having potato chips in here. Ready and Nautilus have <laughs> I'm trying to get a little ponytail. So Sako chimed in saying it's a stoloniferous octocoral. Stoloniferous octocoral. Stoloniferous. Good job, pilot. I believe that's actually what we collected earlier, the green version of that. Oh. Mm. Yeah, now that I'm reading it more in the, uh, more context, yeah, it says it's stoloniferous. Just the handwriting's a little bit too close. <laughs> I think it's stoloniferous. Stoloniferous? Yeah, stoloniferous. Is this still low bait, Um. Give me a minute. Okay. Because I feel like when we go over it, I need to like see how far it goes. But I'm only seeing this one crack, so I'm thinking it's still she. Interesting. Why, you don't think so? Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I was saying, oh, that's it. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there are those holes. I was holes just saying earlier. I was just wondering. Too. I was just wondering. I was just saying earlier that this is the first. This exhibition is the first time I've seen underwater lava flows in real time, so it's like Whoa, what is this? Jelly. Jelly. Ew. Jelly. Yeah. Wow. Brown. We saw these all over the place on ONC. No, oh, they're everywhere. Kupayanaha. 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 Just looks like a hat. <laughs> it <laughs> like looks a like a hat. beanie. Looks like, like an, an acorn. acorn. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> acorn jelly. It has Ring a beautiful lingers. color. You think everything's acorn? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's total fall color. I know. <laughs> now you all want your PSLs. <laughs> Pumpkin oh. spice jelly. Oh, is it about to put on a show for us? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Who play a Naha? So amazing. Wow. Naha. I think it's love. I feel like it's like coming. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like this, it's chasing us down. Yeah, yeah. The slowest chase ever. <laughs> it's like he's going to give her a kiss. Oh, wow. So Hawaiian word for jelly is pololia. 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 Like with an H? No, with an L. L. Polo. Oh, look at it. Lia. Polo Lia. Polo Lia. Ooh, look at it. Oh, wow. Turn this way. Come on. Well, it's, it's just <laughs> reacting to her expression. Give it a turn. Oh, oh wow. you can see the tentacles. Is that an associate there? The white? It possibly could. I can't get a super good look at it. It could be a, some type of um, plat, some type of a. Uh, Parasitic isopod, maybe that can happen sometimes with oh. jellies. Oh, well, goodbye. You said that was polo. Lia. Uh, polo Lia. So P O L O L I A. Polo Lia. P O L O L I A. Polo Lia. Polo Lia. Or jelly. We've got four minutes left. Four minutes. Roger. That's so amazing we got to see that in like our last like five minutes. Thank you, Polo Lia. I, like, I like all your little notes. All my little notes? It's cool. No, it's, it's, it's smart. Thank you. But they you. also look cool. Thank you. She annotates the uh, like the cross section of the transect we're doing. tail? Yeah, no, I Just literally cool. love the cross section of the transect. Yeah. That's like my favorite thing to look at. <laughs> Thank you, mapping team. <laughs> Well, all right, guys, I think, um, you know, if you want to come into a position that's good for uh, recovery okay. or ascending. Bridge now. All right, well. 
Paul Scott, please. Thanks to all of our viewers uh, for, for coming along this dive with us and hanging out. Um, you start going we'll up a bit? Mapping and, uh, overnight and uh, huh? should be back in the water tomorrow in the morning. Yeah. Morning or local time. If you want to stick up with us, we're going to still be here, I guess, when they're pulling it up. And oh, okay. we're probably just going to be oh, blue, chit chatting. Blue water chatting? Mm -hmm. gotcha. We've got yeah. some good questions in here waiting. For okay, us. cool. Well, never mind then. I, well, I'll sign off the seabed, but not off the chat. RV's off bottom. I'll drive to the end of my tether. We've yeah, done a recovery together before, haven't we? Just we, not. We haven't. Or, not, well, not yeah. really. Can um, turn off auto hitting. They let us leave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Well, they let some of us leave. Yeah. Oh yeah, not you. Sorry. Huh? Oh, Virginia just sent us something about the jellyfish. <gasps> Yay! Thank you, Virginia. To the big red jellyfishes, Tiburonia gran rojo. That's crazy because I didn't even think it was red. I thought it was brown. That's what the rojo means. Could you repeat that name again? Um, Tib Uronia. It's been fallen. Sorry, it's my screen just moved. Tiburonia yeah, Gran Rojo. Gran Rojo. Uh, off bottom? Yeah, off bottom. Thank you, Virginia. Nice. I'm so glad we got to see that. Well, now that I'm looking at it, though. That doesn't look like the doesn't tentacles. It looks, the tentacles on these ones are much thicker than what we saw. Yeah. It's similar. Certainly has the same um, Medusa top morphology, mm -hmm. but the tentacles are a lot thicker. Yeah. They were, like, skinny. Okay. Coming up. Let's see, let's see what we're doing. Yeah, probably 25, probably get there maybe. Yeah, no, my cross-sectional notes, I'm hoping to like, look at all of them when they're done yeah, and just yeah. see if there's anything yeah. similar. What are you hoping that we see in the water column, Sebastian? Oh, well, you know exactly yeah, what we I hope I want to see in the water column. Four. Yes. And then when we were on, just like an hour ago, yeah. was, you know, right there. That very specific team before. Oh. I know Mike wants to see a shark. No, well, we might see a shark in the water column. Who knows? Anything's possible. There's never a zero chance. <laughs> 20, 20 meters a minute. Unless we drop a weight, yeah, 20. Two zero. Got it, thank you. So Tina thinks that the jelly could be either a coronata species or a fairy phyla species of jellyfish. Hmm. I'm gonna look those up. Hmm. One downside to our um, taxa guy right now is that we only have benthic animals, so a lot of the jellies are not listed. 
And unfortunately, the HURL website, our other resource, is currently down for the time being. So we're a little bit limited on our pelagic species in terms of defecation. Bridge nav. Just letting you know we're still on track for a recovery at 20 hundred. Thank you. Oh. oh wait, Tori, do you have those questions? Yes, give me one second. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so one viewer is wondering about um, our crew and like how many scientists, navigators, data loggers, video engineers that we have on board and how many hours of a break we get in between our shifts and then how many, or what we do during so, our So yeah, we have 49, 49 people total on board, mm -hmm. 17 of them are crew. In terms of watch standards, we pretty much have three of each. So mm -hmm. three science communication, three watch leaders, three perk pilots, three Argus pilots, three navigators, three video, three data, three science. Um, and then there's like four or five or six non-watch standards, like our expedition leaders and Rennie, who's, who's doing the mapping and stuff like that. Um, oh, and our deck chief, uh, Ken. Um, the heck was that? Oh, I think Jane has got it. That was a weird noise. I think someone was knocking. Maybe it sounded like someone was knocking. I don't know. I really thought someone. It's Malia knocking. I don't know why. Okay. You were saying, Mike? Um. Yeah. And so that that's how many there are for each watch. What else? Um. So uh, they were also wondering, like, what do we do when we're not on watch, or like, oh yeah, so we, we do have um, we do a four-hour shift and then eight hours off. So we're four to eight, and that's a.m. and p.m. Mm -hmm. um, and off watch, we do naps, we do mm -hmm. eating, we do showers, laundry. Mm -hmm. um, Any other like outside work that we may have? Yeah, uh, yeah, plenty of that. Answering oh, emails, yeah. um, sitting out on the porch. Yeah, and I warming up because it's heavily air conditioned on the boat. We also wreck people at Uno. <laughs> um, also, reading puzzles. Yeah, there's a there's a yeah. whole bunch of big puzzles in the lounge, which is nice. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, reading. There's a the I forward the lounge is a, is a nice place to read quietly. Uh, drink a lot of coffee, so I stay awake, which doesn't really work. I don't stay awake. <laughs> Those sorts of things. Which? Uh, how many puzzles have been completed already? Is this puzzle number like? Oh, give me a moment. I need Four? to think. Hold up, hold up. <laughs> there have been quite a few. Um, I feel like you've been working on every single one of them. Yeah, I kind of have. One, two, three, four. I think we're on the fifth one. Wow. But this one's 555 pieces. That's specific. Yeah, I, I thought it was funny because it was 555, five, five, and I was like, oh, angel numbers. And then I was like, I don't know what 555 five, five means, though. It's a, like, it's huh. it's every Hollywood phone number. It's a fake phone number. It starts with five 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 in movies. Huh. That's what that means. I thought that's not oh, a that's real phone that. number. You, what what's that? If they just made up a number, it could actually ring somewhere. But five 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 is nobody's number. Yeah. Give me a call. Five 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 three eight two nine. So as we begin our descent, we are going to mahalo this place. Um, we mahalo Kanaloa the god of the sea who's um, allowed us a glimpse into the depths. And um, we will do that through cultural protocol um, with an oli called Oli Mahalo. 
And uh, this just thanks the place, it thanks the ancestors, it thanks the deities. Um, and knowing that this is an Aina Akua, a place where our kupuna reside and where we will return after death. We're just grateful to be in this space. And so we will, Mahina and I will mm -hmm. do Oli Mahalo as we bring the ROV back up to the Nautilus. Uhola ya kamakaloala Puai ke alohala Kuka i ya kahaloala Pave i maina lehua Mai kaho o ku i ya kahala vaila Mahalo e na akua Mahalo e na kupuna la ea Mahalo me ke alohala Mahalo me ke alohala Mahalo Mahalo Mahalo, that was beautiful. Yeah, that was so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, that was our amazing Malia and Mahina who came up to join our watch briefly for that cultural protocol. Um, so amazing, so grateful to have them here and that they share so much with us. And so important that we reflect as we come back up on everything we were um, able to see and then our samples that we've taken and just acknowledge everything that we're going to learn from them. I find it's equally as satisfying to like to collect the samples as well as process them and mm -hmm. just preparing them for your whatever you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. I just it was so much fun doing sample preparation because the thing that just like kept me going was like the curiosity of what the outcome is going to be. Like I'm so curious, like what is it, is it going to be correctly what I thought it was going to be or is it going to be something completely di different, which is totally fine as well. I don't know. It's just so exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. Can you share a little bit about what it's going to be like after we recover ROVs, Atalanta, and Hercules, and they're back on deck? What happens with our science team? Actually, Sebastian can probably give a, a better description since he's on the data team. I can. So once um, ROV, Hercules, and Atlanta rise to the surface and are securely on board, we wait for a cultural protocol to happen before we can go and collect any samples collected by Herc. Um, so we move very fast to collect any biological samples first so that they can properly be preserved and kept intact, um, followed by rock samples. Once in the lab, we start by measuring and doc photo documenting each sample with their associated sample numbers and make sure to make labels to figure out where these samples are going on the mainland or to museums, to scientists. And we pretty much start subsampling them as we need, if needed, so that we can separate them out and everybody gets what they need. Um, we preserve them usually in ethanol, 95%, for organisms and for rocks. Um, we just tie them down. if. I believe. Isn't that correct, Hannah? That is correct. And we pack them up once they're dry. And you guys cut them open if necessary. Yeah, yeah. We cut them open and then see what's inside. And then if a sample looks really promising, we will take subsamples of it. But yeah, that's generally the process in a nutshell. Um, we also... Oh, and petrological descriptions. That's also... Which is basically describing what the rock looks like, the texture, what minerals can you see just by 
eyes, hands, well, by your eyes alone, and also how big these phenocrysts are. Phenocrysts are just large crystals of minerals in the samples, and they stand out from the surrounding matrix that that is that it's composed of of the rock. So yeah, so we try to give as much of a clear description as possible for whatever scientist, geoscientist uses the samples in their future research. That's correct. And we also process our niskins as well for eDNA, um, which is a bit of a tricky thing to do because we have to be very careful not to get human DNA in it. So it's a very um, sanitary process that is very time consuming. Um, but yeah, also if we had sediment cores, we would process those, but we have not really taken a sediment core this entire expedition so far. I think we did We did one the first like uh, dive, didn't we? Yeah, but it didn't stay intact. Oh, I didn't know that, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Didn't know that. So if we were to take more sample cores in the future, would it be productive to like take two at a time or would it just not matter? Um, just generally one's good because if you're going to get it, you're going to get it. Okay. Um, because just sediment um, cores in general can be really inconsistent in terms of actually keeping the sediment in while yeah. you collect it. Um, so it just has to be the right circumstances and the right scientists asking for it at the right time. Yeah, I was just thinking, I was like, maybe two chances are better than one, but I guess if one goes, maybe that means the other will obviously go Well, but also too. we don't know, there might be five, five? Yeah. There might be five places we want to core out. Yeah. It's unlikely on a seamount's leg, but you never know. And plus you can always reuse a sediment core. True. Mm. If it fails. Okay, I was just curious. No worries. Because I know where we did take the sample core was where there were the dead corals and it was thick sediment. Yeah, it was like there was too many big pieces of mm -hmm. old coral in it and it gotcha. did not create the suction needed mm -hmm. to stay in the tube. Yeah. So. We, had, we tried to sample stuff right. in the Black Sea that would not stay in. It was just like really loose sand. It felt, and we invented this thing where or the ROV guys built it. It was like this uh, steel plate that the the left ROV arm held, and they had Velcroed the core caps, uh, in six core caps onto the steel plate, and it would hold it up, and they put it right next to where you're taking the core, and go, if you lift up, and pop it right on, like, within in seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was how we ended up getting even half halfway decent cores. Yes, getting sediment samples in general can be very difficult to keep them intact, especially the layering. Um, surely because there's like always going to be that moment where you take it out of the sand and something's going to spill, even a small amount. So it's very, very hard to get pristine samples of sediment. And Sebastian, earlier you were talking about the eDNA, the environmental DNA. Can you share a little bit about what we hope to learn from those samples? Yes. Why um, it's important we don't get human. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if what the, the goal of these samples is to be able to detect and learn what corals are associated with what pieces of DNA when you do DNA analysis with this eDNA. Um, so by taking the skins in sight of these large coral colonies in these dense areas where we know what the species are, we're more likely to kind of attribute them to larger amounts of the DNA in the water. Um, so if we have similar species that um, may share DNA with the ones we have, we can have a certain portion of it will match. And we're like, okay, this DNA goes to this coral that we saw. So we're able to kind of filter out those background DNAs and kind of isolate um, whenever we take a water sample, like what, an what creatures are in the area based on those shared identical DNA pieces. And that is something that, like, you'll process the eDNA samples, like, right after we get them off the vehicles? Or it does it, can it wait? Um, long as it's intact, usually it can wait a little bit, as long as it's intact and cold. Um, but usually we start immediately. And same with other biological samples, too? Yes, yeah. biological samples have the highest priority in the order. So I'm kind of curious, the eDNA samples, um, you're looking for a match with the existing corals. Do you ever look for things that may not 
you don't visually see them, but there may be the eDNA uh, marker or whatever that is in the water sample. Is is would that be useful in any way? Yeah, um, any DNA we get can be useful because even if we don't know or it doesn't have a current match, it may have a match in the future. Um, and then that way we know. Oh, when we rerun those DNA and there's in the future and there might be more matches. Like oh, so I guess this species was around, but we just mm -hmm. didn't see it. Gotcha. So it's a great way to uh, kind of survey the amount of organisms and the diversity of organisms without directly viewing it, mm -hmm. which can be very useful in saving a lot of money and time for a lot of um, projects. And it's a lot less intrusive to take a little bit of water than it is to set a, a very large ROV down. Mm -hmm. And we have the capabilities to process that eDNA on board ship. Um, we have the ability to process it down for shipping to a facility that can do the genetic work. Got it. So we do the basic steps to ensure that the DNA is intact and concentrated in the way that's appropriate. And what are some of, sorry, I'm just real curious about this. Cause yeah. <laughs> what are some of the ways that uh, the, the lab the people in the lab are protecting themselves from getting their DNA into the samples? Um, there is a lot of ethanol involved. <laughs> um, so ethanol is very good at um, denaturing DNA pro proteins, so they make them fall apart. So we're often rinsing down tables, the sink with ethanol, and trying to get as much DNA off as possible to make it sanitary as possible. Um, our scientists always wear gloves while handling the samples and ensure that when we're taking water out of the niskins that nothing is touching the water as it's going into the bag. Mm. Um, but yeah, it could be a very sensitive process. So we try to keep a lot of our other processes a good couple steps away so that it doesn't accidentally get into their area and contaminate it. Contaminate it. Is it usually one person doing the Niskin samples? Um, typically, actually, it's yeah. usually two. two. We have usually one person holding the bag because it's a situation where you have to pour the bag into a kind of little like a tube with a, um, how do I describe it? Do you know those like little um, cotton pads mm -hmm. that you use for your face? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like that, it's a little white disc. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to concentrate the DNA on by pouring the water through it. And it's filtering out the water and the smaller materials and catching the DNA. Mm. Very interesting. I can imagine that's a really difficult process when the ship's in like big waves and rocking and rolling. <laughs> yeah, we always, the ROV pilots or someone with the ROV crew always comes in. It's like, we're warning you, we're about to start the boat. So <laughs> be prepared. So we always get a little bit of a heads up when the boat's gonna start moving and things are gonna start rocking. Oh, that's good. And if any of our viewers are interested in watching uh, that process, there is a camera in the wet lab that kind of shows what they're up to. I know that for my students, that's like one of their favorite things to see on the live stream is just what happens afterwards. I think that's the only time my dad ever tunes in is <laughs> during really? lab work. It seems like, uh, I guess just the best time it works for his schedule. He's like, oh, I always see you in the lab. You need to carry more stuff. There's so many girls in there. You need to, you need to be more manly. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> oh, and there's a little jellyfish right there in Kirk's field. Oh, a tiny one. So what was your guys' favorite part of this dive? For me, honestly, probably that jelly at the end. That was cool. That was a really cool jelly. Yeah. And I did not realize how much time we had left, so I just, I'm so grateful that we got to see it, like, right before we finished. I like that we uh, made it all the way to waypoint 10. Mm. Yeah, I love that jelly, too. I'm going to try and pronounce it. Tibber Nia 
Tibernia Grand Rojo. Apparently, we figured out it's not that. It's not. I never <laughs> um, Yeah, uh, Virginia sent us the wrong species because the one she sent us had very super thick tentacles, and ours had a lot more stringy, thin tentacles. Um, but we did have um, Tina Molo Sofa. I can never. Okay. I'm pretty sure I pronounced that correct. Can you say that again? Tina Molo do Sova. She's a scientist Molo, Molo ashore. Sova. Yes. Um, she okay. thinks that it could be a coronata or a fairy phyla species of jellyfish. Okay, whatever it was, it was beautiful. Yeah. It did a little bit of show for us there at the end. Remind me a little bit of those Spanish dancer nudibranchs. Have you mm. seen those? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're lovely. Uh, I think my favorite was, even though it was a little bit, like, spooky, was seeing the big um, dead sponge reef that we saw on the oh, way yeah. up. Because just seeing the amount of sponges in such a small area and being so dominated when we've seen more, mostly coral-dominated areas, it was really cool. I would have loved to see it when it was alive. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it would have been fantastic. I'm sure Chris Kelly would be very, very happy. We saw some eels, some puhi. We saw some fish. I'm trying to think what else. We saw a chimera. Chimera, yeah. yes. Um, what about our watch this morning? Same dive. Yeah. Our watch this morning went by pretty fast. We saw a lot in a short period. So I was like trying to remember going to that super dense amount of information. I know one of the other watches um, saw one of the, the predatory teen four we saw early, in one of the earlier watches. It was the exact same species. Oh, another favorite of mine was the Octocoro stoniferus. That kind of one that looked like a Ikebana arrangement. Yeah. You know, it had like the multiple, it had the beautiful sponge behind. And then it had um, other organisms that I don't remember what their names are. But yeah. <laughs> I do remember the beauty of it. Yeah, that was good. Ooh, I also like the fish. Like we just caught a few fish that were hiding. That was a really good eye. Yeah, you I saw that motion. I just like, saw like a little motion. I'm like, that looks a little bit discolored from the surrounding thing. And I saw it moving. I'm like, wait, that something's moving in there. I thought it might have been like a cucumber or something moving into a hole, but it turned out to be a fish. Shows how useful those, all those holes in the low bait flows are. Mm -hmm. I also really liked um, the Pride Rock formation oh, yeah. that was a really cool moment as well yeah a lot of really cool rock formations on this dive yeah hannah definitely had a good time with her rocks <laughs> so if we wanted to say like rocks would we say pohakus or nope. just no pohaku because there's no s in the hawaiian language uh -huh. <laughs> so you wouldn't put an s on it <laughs> so, you would huh? say na so na pohaku na that means plus that plural. pluralizes it oh that's cool na i did not, definitely did not know that huh so is you just put na in front of anything and that no, makes a plural no. or it's it only depends specific on entity. what the specific sentence structure is you could use mo or you could use na, but it depends on how you are huh. creating your sentence. That's interesting. Mm. Mm. I'll be honest, I struggled a lot with sentence structure when I was on Duolingo. It was really hard for me to, like, I could remember words, but when it was time for me to, like, write out a sentence, I struggled. Yeah. 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 That's, that's it, it's, it's difficult. Like, learning a new language, it is so difficult. Because it's a different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to take, I always kind of wanted to like take like an introductory language class because I never had the opportunity because my school didn't require it, except for that one ASL incident. Um, <laughs> but I don't think that counts as a vocal spoken language. It's very different. Um, but I've always seen people trying to learn languages. I'm curious how well I would do. Um, I do have a disability, a neurological disability, so it makes speaking for me in general a little bit difficult. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any more eccentricities to speaking other languages for me, or if I actually would do better in another mm -hmm. language. Mm -hmm. What language would you choose? Ooh. 
I know my dad would have a preference for Spanish. Um, but I kind of would like to learn like Italian or, yeah, probably <laughs> Italian. French is not as useful to me, I don't think. Is Italian? Yeah. Why? Uh, I seem to know more Italian people than I do like French oh. people, so. But, but Italian, you, Italian's only spoken in Italy. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, you probably know more Spanish people than Italian people. <laughs> by, by a lot. By, yeah. Latino, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would definitely be open to learning new languages, for sure. I just I did Italian because I was like, well, I've al I've always taken Spanish my whole life, and I know I only need one semester of it. And I was like, because I know if I had to test, I also knew like if I was going to do Spanish, that means they were going to have to test me, and I knew that I would be able to get out <laughs> of the beginner Spanish. And I was like, I don't want to go. I was like, I don't need it to be harder than it is. Right. So then I was like, you know what? They can't test me on Italian because I know it's not on my like report card or anything. <laughs> So I was like, and I have to be in, t in the intro of that. So <laughs> then I chose that's Italian. Some, that's some good logic. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't want to test out of stuff, because then, then you're in something that's really hard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't want to do that to myself. I did that in Latin, and I, the first, I only took two classes, two Latin classes in college, and I was just like, I did not learn this well enough in high school to be taking this level of Latin. I was like, I'm done. Oh, yeah, no. If I would have actually tested like because you had to test for Spanish and I was like I can't do it like I know that I would be placed at a higher thing that they would expect more from me than I would be yeah. willing to give <laughs> especially with the other courses that I was taking yeah. I was like there's no way no well, way especially if it's not something for your major like yeah you don't want to be killing yourself all semester for something that's not actually what you're you're uh, focused on no, exactly exactly so that's why that's why I, that was another reason why I took Italian because I didn't want to take French because that's too basic. Like, I could have <laughs> taken French in high school, but I didn't. So I chose Italian because it was also it's also very similar to Spanish. So yeah. I was like, that's also a good thing for me because that can help me get a good grade as well. <laughs> you were very, very strategic about this. So when yeah. I was taking Olelo Hawaii, I took two years in college. Um, we couldn't write in class. So we, when we would come to class, we had to just listen because it is an oral language. And so there was no writing allowed. So this oh, wow. is a totally different way of learning, yeah? Yeah. And so it was amazing. We are Kumo, um, oh, one of my most favorite people in the world, Kumo Ekela, um, was just the most amazing. So we did plays and we had to, um, you know, tell stories. And it was just such an engaging environment. And I was the oldest in my class. So everybody's at 18, 19 years old. They already have like four years of Olelo Hawaii. And here I am coming in like brand new. It's probably the hardest class I ever had in my life. Wow. Four days a week, it, mm -hmm. the, the energy expended, you know, the studying. I think I just, I just kind of assumed amazing. that you'd grown up knowing it. No, our language was banned um, oh, since the overthrow of gotcha. the kingdom. So yeah. Hawaiian language was really lost in a generation. So my mother, my grandparents spoke Olelo Hawaii. Okay. My mother could uh, speak in Olelo Hawaii, um, but she didn't often because she had no one to speak with. And so my generation didn't grow up yeah, okay. with Olelo that makes Hawaii. Sense, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's um it's an interesting process to learn your mother your mother tongue, you know. Yeah. But we did have a weekend where we had to she had us all come out to this beautiful beach house and we couldn't speak no English. It was just Olelo wow. Hawaii the whole entire weekend. From cooking, you know, we all had to cook. We were um, having activities. I'll just say that there was a lot of silence <laughs> because, you know, a lot of us were not really fluent. I mean, we couldn't speak and we were afraid, you know, it's kind of an intimidating situation. Mm -hmm. But just having that, you know, opportunity to just be with other speakers. And, I, I just meant because yeah. you, you know so much of it now and you, you, you communicate it very well. That's, that's yeah, why I had to yeah. assume that. I'm still in the process of learning. Yeah. So I go every Wednesday to my uh, grandson's. Punana Leo, so they have um, language classes, and they they don't want to just teach the child; they want to teach the family, yeah. so that the children have a language community all around them, 
So I'll, I'll go when I'm home. I'll go on Wednesdays to the class and learn. And it's great because I want to be able to make sure when he gets older, he, he has people who are supporting him in his language acquisition. And so, yeah, yeah. That's how we make change, yeah? Yeah. yeah. That's also really interesting that, like, you couldn't, you couldn't write anything down where as like we've constantly asked you for like spellings of yeah. the words mm -hmm. and I was like imagining like not having the spelling yeah. and I was like wow that's yeah. so that's hard it's all up here yeah. you gotta put it all up here and that was her point in teaching us is that she wanted us to learn like how our ancestors learned mm. so it was so difficult you know being raised in this western way where you write everything down and then have to flip it into something totally different. So, yeah, it was so That's amazing. So crazy. One of the best experiences of my life. The hardest, but yeah. so worthwhile. How long was the class? You said you were going four days a week. Four days a week for an hour. For an hour. Yeah. And then how long did you do that? Two years. Two wow. years. Wow. And I'm just like at a baby level. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I could not tell. That, yeah, you're. That's that's wild. Did you have anyone like going with you, or were you just going by oh, yourself no, by and myself. met friends? Yeah, yeah. And that's the beauty, I think, of these um, courses in Olelo. Oh, fish. Sorry. <laughs> Where are what you? Ia. E Ia <laughs> e is the Hawaiian word for fish. Ia. E I just saw the corner of my eye. I had to catch it. <laughs> Go on. I'm sorry. Yeah, I forget what I was talking about. You were the talking value. about going alone. Oh yeah. So I yeah, I was going to college. Mm -hmm. So I, I went because I wanted to learn the language. Yeah. That was really important for me. So you were taking that class then on top of other classes? Oh so like yeah, I was a full-time student. Yeah. And a mom. And a mom. That's insane. And working. <laughs> yeah. Superwoman. Yeah. Superwoman. <laughs> well, you know what? You do what you got to do. You know, you got mouths to feed. You got a degree you got to get. <laughs> you just like focus on what you got to do and you just do it. So that is so impressive. I couldn't imagine having to take care of babies right now, like in grad school. Like I can't, like I can't even imagine. That's crazy. Yeah, time management uh -huh. is a key critical skill. <laughs> and help, you know, if you can, your family is important, or Hana, uh -huh. friends. If you don't have family, you create your tribe. It's really inspiring. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I think my older kids, because my two older kids were the ones who were like helping. They would pick up the kids on the bike. The little ones, like we'd have a, a little preschooler on his handlebars. Oh, my older son, <laughs> pick him up from preschool, bring him home. Like it was, you know, I really am thankful for my two older kids who just really stepped up. Wow, that's awesome. Especially, I'm sure they got really close with them and like... They did. They were like, yeah. you know, kind of role models. Even yeah. even if they had an age gap, they were still close. Mm -hmm. That's so cute. I love it. Mm. I couldn't imagine not being friends with my, like, close friends with my siblings. You yeah. said you're the oldest, yeah? Yeah. Do you have sibling story? Mm -hmm. I'm also the oldest. Got a I'm also the oldest. Oh my god. I'm the youngest. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm second youngest. <laughs> second youngest. So, not middle, but not a middle child. I'm number 11 of 12. Oh, that's. that's yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember wow. the tw one of 12. Yeah. Ooh. That's awesome. Yeah, that, talk about chaos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did a, a lot of your beautiful chaos. Yeah. <laughs> did a lot of your older siblings like 
also do the same as like your children did with the younger siblings? Oh yeah, they, yeah. my older siblings took care of us. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the expectation, right? As an elder, you take care of the younger siblings. So, oh, definitely. And we hear the stories all the time when we get together. <laughs> <laughs> that must be such a fun family reunion. Oh my God, my family is so cool. Like oh. they're my biggest supporters, literally. They are just so amazing. That makes me so happy. I know, I love that. How many of them have been, like, have people been watching the live stream? They have been. Yeah? Yep. My sister actually, I joined in with her grandkids. They were over in Michigan. And uh, we got to do a ship to shore with them. And then I send, um, you know, the links and stuff. So they're all watching. And yeah, they're so excited. <laughs> How many grandchildren do you have? I have five. No, I have six. Oops, I have six. <laughs> <laughs> I have three, three grand boys, three grandsons, and three granddaughters. Aww. Yeah, they're awesome. I can tell that just by mm -hmm. what you talk about them. <laughs> do they all live near you? Um, they live on Oahu, so they they're close by, like within an hour. So you had five kids, right? Mm -hmm. So did you always want to have also a big family? I did. Because wow. I love kids. I just, I always have been around kids and I enjoy teaching. And so yeah, having a big family was just a, a, a normal thing for me. Wow. That's awesome. One of my friends growing up, she was one of four and Literally, it was so much fun going to her house when, yeah. we were, when I was young because I was like, you could play like anything. You could play any like kickball. There's always enough for like a team. Oh, you always have like, a team. Yeah, always. <laughs> and I was like, this is the coolest. Like, and they were all so close and like competitive, especially, which is also funny because like whenever we would play like Wii games or like any like type of video game, everybody would literally have a controller. Whereas like at like my house, it was like only two people could play and. <laughs> but they were like all four, so it was it was intense. But it was so much fun, and, and I was you like, end up being one of the children. Like in yeah. our family, we ended up having like twenty because we always had other people's friends, yeah, like mm -hmm. living at our house. That that was me. <laughs> Eating, you know, they just were welcome. So we always had just like huge amounts of people at our house. It was always a party at their house. <laughs> Because my friend was the oldest girl of, and she had three younger brothers. So um, it was so much. And like her younger brothers were my younger siblings' ages. So it was just very like close knit. Yeah, yeah. It was super fun. So I could totally see the like, how fun it would be to have like five kids. I don't think I'll have five kids, yeah. but it, I could see how fun it would be. It takes a lot of resources. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not in this economy for me. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. I love babysitting. Babysitting is like babysitting my little cousins. They're, that's so fun. I love talking to them. Uh -huh. I know them as like the iPad generation. Because they really are. They're, they play Roblox all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if you've noticed. I don't know. Do high schoolers play? Like... Or can um, you tell? Like your class? Like I think what's your interesting students? to me like about my video students, games or anything? Yeah, so like for my students, I think what's interesting to me is like a lot of them grew up with like streaming services. Mm -hmm. So like they did not, like a lot of them it seems like did not just kind of like sit down and watch whatever was on like Disney Channel or yeah, whatever was yeah, on yeah. Nick, which is like, yeah, which yeah. was, I think you might be muted, Mike. Oh. Um, you said yeah, that just that they get to pick yeah. like, what they want to watch. Yeah. As hey, this is the channel you're watching. This is what's on. Go. Yeah, and mm. that's something that I think once I realized that, I was like, oh, <laughs> y'all are different. Um, and like, Don't have to zip the commercials. Yeah, and so like, they'll be on like Disney Plus sometimes in class, and it'll be interesting seeing like what they choose to watch, because I'm like, this is a show that I grew up with, and they're yeah, like watching it for wait. the first time ever. And I'm like, they don't understand what it felt like to have to wait for Hannah Montana episodes to come out. <laughs> no. What, was it Fridays? Like yeah. literally like Fridays at 7.30 and yeah. that's when I had to learn what central time and <laughs> seven, eight. Time. Yeah, <laughs> 7, 8 and I was like, what the hell? 
How does that mean? Just give me one time. Eight seven central. Eight seven central. And yeah. I was like, Are you kidding me? Yeah. As like an eight year old, I was like, This is so confusing. Wait, wait, yo, you were in Central Time, right? Yes. It was um, earlier then. You got it earlier. It doesn't matter. At the time, <laughs> I was like, It doesn't make sense. Would you rather wait until eight? I would have rather them just say seven o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I also just like. <laughs> I remember loving so, so, so much just like um, all the Halloween movies and like oh how much gosh. of an event that I was. Love those movies. Like such an event. Or just like oh just gosh. the whole lineup. And like that's something where I'm like, that makes me sad. I don't know if they, like, I have no idea what's going on in like Disney Channel right now. Like, I have no um, younger. Based off babysitting, zombies, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty zombies. much it. <laughs> <laughs> they know zom the movie Zombies. <laughs> But uh, other than that, I have no idea. Yeah, my students, like, it's interesting because, like, they'll also talk to me about, like, when they got their first phone <gasps> or, like, when they got their first, like, smartphone. And, like, it's just so wild to me because I'm, like, I cannot imagine having access to the Internet when on did a you smartphone. Have... Yeah. Like, yeah. at that age. Like, How old were, did, were you when you got a smartphone? So when I was, like, maybe, like, 11 or 12, I had, like, a flip phone literally okay. just to text my parents when I would, like, go down the street and, like, play. And then I got like an iPod touch in like eighth grade and like had access to like the internet on it. Mm -hmm. But like I got like a, I guess like a smartphone like in high school. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I got I got an iPhone, my first smartphone, the year that I finished my PhD. Whoa. Wow. Wow. Because I got a smartphone <laughs> when I was, when I turned 12. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got, because I got a phone because I was in, I was on like three or four different sports teams. Mm -hmm. So my parents, they were like, you need a phone. Just and to so, communicate. Yeah, yeah, just to communicate about like picking me up, who I'm going home with, if anything changes in practice or anything like that. Because there were times when they would like leave me at, at practice and I would just be sitting there. And I'm like, well, and my friends are like, is your mom coming? And I was like, I don't know. I don't, I don't really have any way to contact her. And then I would. Ha that was like some of the phone numbers that I needed to memorize was like just my mom and my dad's. So I would just call from like. Yeah, we would have used the pay phone at the high school to yeah. let them know that we were ready to get picked up. Mm. And for kids listening, a pay phone is a thing that used to exist. <laughs> it fits a dirty pot That's what right I here. Used to use. <laughs> yeah. I think it's this. Yeah, because I can, I can recreate it here. Were like pay phones everywhere? Were they hard to like find? Yeah, every, yeah, every everywhere. public place. Yeah. Okay. Like yeah. the high school had like four <laughs> of them. The high school had four of them inside. Oh. I think there was even one outside. So what were like the expectations of like when you could use the pay phone? Could you just like at any point yeah. in the day just You just go as you had a dime. Yeah. <laughs> you could use it yeah. I mean, you could go to the <laughs> office and ask to call home and they would, uh, you'd have to dial nine to get out of the, of yeah. the, uh, of the high school network. Um, yeah, but, you know, sometimes, it, but it, you know, if it's after s class hours and you're for sports or something, you have to use a pay phone. Yeah. We, we, we figured out that we could call collect and just say, ready to get picked up and hang up and then they would decline the charges and come pick us up. Oh, that's smart. Yeah, so we don't have to waste huh. a quarter. Wow. I learned how to tap the payphone. I had some really cool friends who taught me how to do that. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. I yeah, we used the, the gum wrappers, you know, from the Wrigley's gum, the oh, metal yeah. foil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you would put it into the speaker on the phone oh. and then you tap it. There was a little hole on the actual machine. <laughs> and you put the two together and it would create a connection and then you could dial in. Huh. So you could get a free phone call. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. That, I would do that. I would cheat yeah, the I would system do that. like that. Yeah. I couldn't imagine, well, I guess technically we kind of do paper phone calls now, but. Um, Lounge van. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Different time. Totally Good lounge. Time. Lounge to van. Huh? Oh. Lounge to van, yeah. We, yeah. We finished the puzzle. Hey! Oh, hey. solid. Good Congrats. Now, now to start the sixth one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, I can't wait to go look at it. I know, that one looked <laughs> like it was pretty. Is this like the world uh -huh. map one? Okay. Yeah. I didn't see it since it came out like last night. That was fast. Oh, that was fast. Yeah, no, it did come out last night. Oh. And then we were I thought, working I, on it. I thought it was all like the same puzzle that you've been working on this whole time, but I guess there's no, been no, multiple. No. Yeah. There's been like multiple iterations. But for they're sure. not like 
regular puzzles, right? They, they're like mm -hmm. animal shapes and stuff. They're like all different types of shapes. Like yeah. for this map puzzle, there was some uh, horoscope. There was like a Libra sign and there was a Scorpio sign and then there was a palm tree and then there was, um, what else? There was all different types of shapes. It's so, yeah, they're so cool. Um, you can tell they're expensive. I usually get my puzzles from like five below. So, um, and usually from like five below, they have like, it's all the same, mm -hmm. literally all the same puzzle piece. So they, they just really, print it. Yeah. Right, yeah. So it's really just like guessing, whereas like these are very specific and I love it. It's so much more fun. And it really is beautiful, like the artwork on it. So, yeah. You can spend like 10 minutes looking at it and not get a piece. Yeah, I could. I could like, usually when we first put it out, we just like sort put them. A, we don't even sort, we no. just like flip them all over. And then we're like, okay, sometimes we'll just start like on random pieces that look really cool. And we're like, let's just start that. And then, or we start like Sebastian does with like the top or the bottom, which kind of makes the most sense. But I like the edge pieces. That yeah, one doesn't pieces. really truly have like flat edge pieces though, this right? This one that we did today, yes. The uh, last one was... The last one also did, but it was different because some of the edges were made by like a point. Like just one point mm -hmm. was an edge. And then there were like false pieces because like yeah. you think that they're flat, but then you put them up like against the light and you see a very, very barely noticeable curve. And it's like, wow, okay, that's rude. <laughs> that puzzle made me very frustrated, I'm not going to lie. The, the one with no them. picture? Oh, Whichever all of them. one I sat down to do. Yeah, I've gotten, like, I don't know, I usually, like, puzzles, I'm, I'm usually fine with, like, sitting and doing them. So I just never, like, have to, I'd rather do other things. <laughs> usually I'd rather do other things with my time, like reading. But my, my roommates and I got TV. really into puzzles during COVID. It takes super concentration, yeah? Like you yeah, just it's really so much focus, fun. Yeah. Like your brain, like I just go off adrenaline and just like boom, 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 boom. Yeah. I think the good thing to keep your mind off of things is just focus on like doing the puzzle and you kind of just let things melt away. Mm. Oh, absolutely. It's perfect. It makes me think maybe I should yeah, not watch as many like TV series and movies and maybe do puzzles more. But your list is so long. My list is so long. It is. And there's so much to watch. Um, there was a comment earlier, but we were talking about other stuff, but they said they went and looked in your bio and saw that you had watched, or you recommended Nathan for you and that they've been watching that oh in between God, dives. Stop, I, I love stop. Nathan for you. It's stop. so funny. Nathan for you. Is, <laughs> that's why I said absolutely, because that's from Nathan for you. Now, let me tell you, that TV show is so funny. It's on HBO. I suggest you go watch it. It's hilarious. And it's about this guy who goes around. Los Angeles and he actually went to Long Beach once and it's super funny and he just like gives these people business ideas like for example one of his business ideas was at one of those souvenir shops like on Hollywood Boulevard there he was like what if we made it like they were filming a movie at this souvenir shop like people love seeing Hollywood behind the scenes like if you see somebody like filming something obviously people are going to want to go and check it out now imagine if these, if the audience was part of the movie and all they would have to do is go in and pay for one of the souvenirs, but it has to be like a part of like the film, like part of the story. So he got all these people to be a part of the movie and he was like, Johnny Depp is gonna be in this movie. And he looked, he hired a Johnny Depp impersonator and he just stuck him like in the, uh, in like this his own um like rv mm -hmm. so he, he basically like let all these like uh, the audience and the extras come in and he was like you're really he would tell them he was like okay so imagine you're a really expensive person and you want to buy up as many souvenirs as possible and they're like okay and so when they would go and they would have like tons like 80 dollars worth of souvenirs they would be done and they were like, okay, so are you gonna give me the money back? And he was like, no, you paid for those. That's like yours. And they were like, 
I don't, what am I gonna do with like this trophy? And they were, he was like, they were getting really mad. And he was like, okay, what if we take them back to go meet Johnny, Johnny Depp? And so they went back and they took these people back there and to meet Johnny Depp. And it wasn't really Johnny Depp. And it wasn't really Johnny Depp. <laughs> and they believed that it really was him. And so Johnny Depp was like teaching them how to like play guitar and he signed all of their souvenirs. <laughs> and it was so funny. And then he got sued. Well, he was gonna get sued if it wasn't turned into a real movie. So then he turned the whole like souvenir stuff into a movie. And it was the funniest episode I've ever, there was also, there are other funny episodes. I know, I honestly highly recommend Like that. watch it and then it like leaves my brain. But <gasps> no, I, I do like watching them. I just for some reason cannot remember what he's I, been up to. Oh God, I, I've watched so many, so many times. I never rewatch anything ever. And I've rewatched Nathan for you so many times because it just makes me, it never fails to make me laugh no matter how many times I watch it. But that's so funny that people are seeing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they said the Hannah in between dives, they go and watch Nathan for you. I am that's really so, funny. That is so funny, and I love that. Because he also has a new show called The Rehearsal. Okay, I'm thinking of The Rehearsal. I don't even want to get into The Rehearsal right now. It is so ridiculous. It's it is, so it's, funny. It is it funny. It is so funny. <laughs> it's just super, super highly recommend. Definitely. They're 20 minute episodes, so super easy to watch. Only like four seasons. Mm -hmm. So, Nathan for you. It's hilarious. You missed a whole, I gave a whole episode away. It was so good. And then I missed all the spoilers. Yeah, you did. But, um, yeah, fantastic show. Yeah, I thought to put those fun facts on there because I was like, I don't know. I was like, <laughs> I was like, maybe somebody will like say something, but I'm glad somebody actually did. Because I think I put like, I think I put my favorite movie and then I put, I put TV show that I am obsessed with. And then I said, I think I said I listened to Taylor Swift. And that that's that was pretty much like my fun facts. I'm gonna go look. I'm gonna go look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you're gonna like read the whole thing. <laughs> I thought you were I'm just gonna honest, go. I've definitely read the whole thing before. I just don't think I remember this. Well, I'm curious how many expeditions they missed me for. Because they hadn't gone back in the archive all the way. Oh yeah, what are my hobbies? That, that was the question. And I was like, let's just give them everything specific that I like. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, so yeah, they only go back to 2011. What, what is that? Oh, oh yeah. Whoa, he's done so much. So it's 19 that are listed here, but there's... In 2019, or in 2009 I did three in 2010 I did three so it's 25 25 but they, yeah they haven't they haven't put all of the uh, they haven't backlogged them all yet oh my gosh is that only two of them? I did I did more than this I did one another one of this that's not listed 26. <laughs> yeah, we looked at um, some World War II wrecks, um, but it was for Nat Geo, so they may not have like included it in the, on the website. And also, some of these names are different. Anyway, no, oh, it's cool. I'm glad that they do that. They keep track for you. Yeah.
So this was in a I think it was NA012. Twelve. Is that right? I forgot I did that. Oh, in 2012 we did a Dodge Peninsula as well, so that's another one, 27. I see him out there. I don't see him with the radio, though. Randy's getting suited up. Yeah, there's a couple missing. I think they're probably just lumped together with uh, under, under different headings. It looks like he might be holding the radio. They put it in, he's got a radio in his pocket. We're going to be recovering into the sunset again. Like 273 meters? Yeah, well, look, I look at Argus 277 because Argus okay. is the one at the end of the winch. Okay. Yep, everyone's milling about outside. So the front row talks to the deck. So Sebastian, when y'all go to the wet lab to get ready to go grab the samples, um, what do y'all have to do to be ready? Get gloves on, grab those bins that the samples will go in? Yep, um, it's pretty much um, grab bins, um, get gloves on. Um, for those, the other two dialoguers that are not currently on shift, they are prepping um, sample tags in advance. Mm. So that they're all set up with sample tags so that we don't have to write them out as we do our, our observations. So when you get them in there, I know that y'all will like look at them, take pictures, yep. put the tags on them, store them. Yep. And then EDMA stuff will happen kind of simultaneously, but separate. Mm -hmm. And then usually geology is doing their thing at the same time. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're probably going to just take initial measurements. And what kind of measurements? Right. Like how wide it is, how tall it is, X, Y, Z, X, Z. How do you tell the top from the bottom? We do, we, do you we just don't. decide one side yeah, is? Yeah, we just decide. <laughs> yeah. We usually put whatever the more stable side is at, on the bottom hmm. so that it won't roll around. Makes sense. Yeah. far away we are from the next seamount? I don't know. I haven't looked at the whiteboard to see like how long transit will be. Yeah. I think it's an 11 hour transit, something like that. Oh, that's not bad. Pretty short. 
so we'll probably dive at noon tomorrow? No, because then we got a map. Right. Yeah, for a little bit. I don't know how long, though. Last time they mapped for like 15 hours, I think. We'll probably dive at uh, noon, 11 a.m. Central. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's kind of what I thought. Just okay. kidding. I'm looking at your ship to shore schedules and I'm like, that is a lot. It, it is a lot. I'm trying not to think about it. I'm excited though. There's just a lot early in the morning, but a lot of those are like with my school, my school districts. Like I really want to be on them. Um, so yeah, definitely like Monday, I'll be like in and out, in and out, in and out on SPL. I think you muted. I think I heard you say, are there any tomorrow? I think there's maybe like one or two, um, which like on the weekends, it's kind of nice to be able to catch up. I have a lot of grading that I need to do tomorrow and we need to like look through some of the pictures, but um, on weekends, it's kind of quiet. We should be sure. Oh, that's good. Because we need to have a break, a bit yeah. of a break, yeah. Yeah. I'm excited, though, for the ones we have coming up on Wednesday. We'll have one with, like, my entire school. So, like, oh, all nice. the kids will be in homeroom. Um, I think me and Mahina are planning on doing that one Sweet. together. Sweet. Yeah. And then we've got one, I have one more class period of my own students that I need to talk to. And then a couple more, like, biology classes at our school. And then some of the elementary schools in our district. I love talking to them. They're That'd so be sweet. Fun. Yeah. yeah. Elementary kids are so great to I know. engage with. And it makes it like, I, it's so funny to see them just be excited when I'm like, I tell them the school that I teach at. And I'm like, do y'all know that school? And for some of them, like they've got older siblings or mm -hmm. they know that's the high school they'll go to. So they're just like, so excited. <laughs> so yeah, I love talking to them. We haven't had um, too many middle school. No, I've noticed that too. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, I'm gonna run to the bathroom real quick. I love how you're just sitting there like this. Yes. You're just thinking, mm -hmm. pondering. As a scientist does. Yes. What are you, what are you penny for your thoughts? Yeah. Honestly, just kind of like spacing out, looking at the blue water. Yeah. I know. I'm thinking about what I look forward to, like, when I go back on shore. And I'm like, I think the thing that I'm like most looking forward to is uh, my closet. Your closet? <laughs> yeah. I love my clothes. I basically think that there's actually been like someone entering my room at least three times while I've been gone. Because they've been like repair requests for my room and it didn't get fulfilled before I left. I kept on getting emails like, oh, assignment complete. So, yeah, so I've just been like moving stuff around my room. Nice. Yeah, also another thing I can't wait is sweet tea. I can't wait to drink sweet tea again. Yeah, the sweet tea's okay. Sweet tea is fantastic. Meh. You're insane. But also from the Yeah, south. we have a DT winch that's down on this. Oh. We have a DT winch that's down on the social deck. And that's our payout indicator for that. Dude, they, they built the vans, yeah. Uh, what was that? Come off SPL. I also can't wait to like tell people about this experience, mm. like sharing what it was like. I think it's going to be so much fun. I think I have a presentation twice about this. Nice. Already scheduled. 
probably would give more, honestly. I don't I don't have any like talks. The only thing that I have to prepare for is AGU. Oh yeah, AGU. Are you going? No. Don't have the geo I don't have that geologically focused as a topic. Yeah, but you can still go. Where is it this year? San Francisco. Ooh. Maybe I should go. Yeah, I'll be there. When is it? Uh, December 11th through 15th. Oh, uh, the finals. Damn. That sucks. Yep. When do you graduate? This semester. Oh my gosh, congrats. Thank you. Wow, so yeah, so okay, that makes sense why you want to take the semester off before you do PhD. Yeah, because, because this makes sense to start in the spring when I could just start in the fall. Yeah. Plus, I get some time to tour some of the campuses. Do we like finish at eight? Um, I finish at eight. You Watch can leave whenever video. at this point. I guess that's true. I think it's just me and um, Malia, and yeah. I think we're the only ones that have to stay the whole time. Yeah. Oh, you're. Yes, we are still here, but our shift almost almost over. Yeah. Just a few more minutes. Seven minutes. I say until Herc is on the deck. I say I can sing a seven minute song. Don't but start singing Taylor Swift, please. Well, I do know a seven minute Taylor Swift song. Plus I feel like there's copyright somewhere in there since we're live streaming. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you can swim, sing exactly like Taylor Swift, but I think the lyrics alone. Damn. I was... <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Well, I think my favorite thing from this dive is was the big poo 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 he poo he. The eel. Mhm. Mm the big eels. Yes, the big cutthroat eels. Yes. Those, those were really cool. Because those were the first time that I've seen them. I think I think we may have saw one on one of the previous dives, but it was more like this. Was is it our an arm watch? Yeah, it was like, a, I think it was one of those ones where it was like a quick kind of a kit and run situation. Uh -oh. Where it appeared for a second and then it was gone. But yeah, those things are really cool. And somebody saw Tina 4 this morning, well, last night. Yeah, someone saw the predatory Tina 4. Mm -hmm. And then I chimed in in the lounge mic and said had a that was a Tina 4, that was a predatory Tina 4. I got very excited about it. As you should. Also, uh, a highlight for me was um, our hitchhiker. Oh, yeah, that was cute. <laughs> Or um, Galathead ah, Squat Lobster that decided to hitch a ride on Herc. Fifty meters. The sunset is so pretty out there. I have four minutes to see it. Just yeah, the little wait. peaks on the cams, it looks very nice. Mm -hmm. All right, now team, now that we are at fifty meters, we'll uh, switch over to operational talk for recovery. Thank you. All right, thank you.
on the surface, directly astern. Control van copies. Atalanta is on the surface. Copy that. Really? Mark used to do that? That's cool.
Lurch coming alongside, just about even with the stern. Copy that, thank you. Kirk is out of the water. Copy that. High voltage secure. High voltage secure.